Thanks so much for having me, uh, Steffi and uh, team, and Simon, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Dan Mapes. Uh, I'm the founder and president of a uh, company in California called Versus, uh, Versus Labs, uh, and also um, our spinoff, which I'll explain a little bit about today, called the Spatial Web Foundation, um, uh, which is the um, uh, kind of the, uh, the new protocols that we need for a, a new web uh, to uh, sit on top of the web we're currently using and take us into some exciting new areas. Uh, just a little bit brief about myself. Um, I'm a longtime uh, entrepreneur. Um, uh, did my graduate work in artificial intelligence at Berkeley. Um, created something uh, called a media lab uh, in Silicon Valley in the, uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s. And uh, we did a lot of research on um, three-dimensional computer graphics, artificial intelligence, um, uh, kind of everything to do with uh, holograms and other kinds of really exciting technologies, spun off some companies, uh, launched some new uh, uh, IP. And, uh, but really the, uh, the thing that uh, we had in our minds all along was how do we get to this thing called the spatial web? How do we get to a 3D web? We think in 3D, we walk around the world in 3D, but our web is in 2D. And um, so that took a lot of R&D to kind of figure it out. And so I'm really excited to share, uh, share that with you uh, uh, today, uh, what we've done there. So uh, we, call, uh, we call this the, the evolution of the spatial web because it really is an evolution. It stands on the shoulders of uh, all the digital technologies that have gone before. And it's hard to remember, but uh, the um, computers were only invented 75 years ago. And uh, the World Wide Web was, uh, the internet itself was only invented in uh, 1969, 1970. And the World Wide Web was invented in, um, in uh, 1994, 1995, and here we are today. Well, guess what? From the first computer to the first internet is 25 years. From the first uh, part of the internet, the stage of the internet, to, uh, to the World Wide Web was 25 years. And from the World Wide Web to the spatial web is 25 years, it's amazing. So, uh, and that has to do with Moore's law. Uh, chips just get faster and faster in the ensuing years, and suddenly we can do new things that we couldn't do before. Uh, networks get faster and larger. Um, so um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. Maybe, uh, let me just show you a little uh, video of uh, what we're stepping in here uh, today uh, to see. Can you, can you see that eye? Uh, does it come up on the screen okay? Or not yet. On the old slide? Not yet, Dan, yeah. Yeah, that's, sometimes that's a problem. Well, let me just uh, take us uh, to this next slide then. Uh, here we go. Uh, so, we talk about the evolution of the spatial web. Uh, well, Earth is an evolutionary planet. And what we're going through today not only in technology, but in society. And I know that's what uh, uh, this conference is about. You know, how is this ongoing technological juggernaut going to impact our personal lives, our work lives, uh, our university lives, all this kind of thing. Uh, so um, uh, since Earth is an evolutionary planet, what we're seeing is just something that's always been going on on this planet. Uh, life is evolving. And it's evolving right now, although this is probably a really big inflection point. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see why here in a minute. Uh, there's, three, there's three types of uh, evolution that take place on planet Earth. Uh, one is genetic evolution. The next is mimetic evolution. And then lastly is the one we're stepping into next is when the genetic and the mimetic combine. Uh, so genetic evolution, we know a lot about. That's really the DNA and uh, the evolution from single-celled organisms through all of life. Mimetic evolution is uh, uh, what happens uh, around the uh, idea of the evolution of thought, the, idea, the evolution of ideas, the evolution of technologies, the evolution of culture. And so um, the planet's been around for four billion years, so genetic evolution is about four billion years old. Mimetic evolution's really taken off in the last 10, 12,000 years. And uh, with CRISPR technology and genetic engineering and other kinds of exciting new technologies, we're now stepping into the third phase of genetic plus mimetic. And we have good old Charles Darwin uh, reminding us that uh, 
it's not really uh, the strongest that survives, and it's not the uh, most intelligent that survives. It's the ones that are most adaptable to change. And I know that's what uh, Steffi and the team are all about, really getting us ready for this big inflection point that's going to come. Because uh, what's so strange about change uh, in evolution is that um, it doesn't just change, it also speeds up. <laughs> so just when we're used to, since we've had the World Wide Web now for 25 years, uh, we've kind of seen, okay, that's what 25 years does. But we're going to get probably in the next 10 to 15 years, more change than we got in the last 25. Wow. So we not only have to adapt to change, we have to adapt to the pace of change. And, uh, you know, the, the earlier you adapt as a company uh, and, or as an individual, the, the better it is. You're not playing catch up. So genetic evolution, uh, we know this pretty well. Um, there it is, 4 billion years of evolution, oldest fossil so far found, 4.2 billion years ago, uh, Cambrian explosion about 500 million years ago, uh, 420 million years ago, plants colonize, amphibians appear, then dinosaurs, and then mammals evolved from dinosaurs. And then, then the great ape line, and then we spill off from the uh, ape line about 7 million years ago to create the uh, hominid line. And then modern Homo sapiens appeared on the planet about 200, 250,000 years ago. So this is a remarkable story. And a lot of people talk to me, you know, say, aren't you worried about the future? It looks very dystopian. We've got a lot of problems. Uh, we're running out of everything, uh, energy, clean water, whatever it is. And I go, do you think that the force of evolution that took us from a single-celled organism four billion years ago, through all of these life forms, through catastrophic damage from asteroid hits and volcanic activity and everything else, still thrives. Do you think that's stopped now? No, no. It's going right through our fingers right this second. Well, everything we invent, all the new companies we start, what Steffi and the team are doing here, this is all part of evolution in action. And so here we're looking at a four billion year span. And that little red dot down there in the right hand corner is the whole last 12,000 years. <laughs> That's how much evolution we're getting. But now we're, we're shifting from only evolving through our genes and evolving our biology. We're now shifting to evolving our consciousness and our brains and our thought. And so we call that mimetic evolution. And mimetic evolution uh, really uh, has uh, really blown up in the last 10 to 12,000 years since the last ice age. And uh, it, we call this the Holocene. Uh, the Holocene really is when all the great breakthroughs have happened uh, from the movement from the Stone Age uh, to the Agricultural Age, from the Agricultural Age to the first understandings of mass production and capital formation and the age of corporations and factories and banks, uh, then into the information age. <clears throat> and now we're stepping into something that we call the, uh, the exponential or spatial or spatial uh, uh, web age, which we're going to talk about today. But these things all stand on each other's shoulders. Each one leads to the next. So my feeling is, uh, fasten your seatbelts. Uh, this has just been a warm up. Uh, the best years of humanity are in front of us. Uh, we're about to really do something that we've only seen in science fiction movies, and we're about to make it real. And we're even going into space. Uh, we're going to clean up the planet. We're going to clean up uh, our oceans. We're actually going to turn this whole thing around, and we're going to do it largely between 2020 and 2050, this next 30 years. And then uh, the run from 2050 to 2100 will be the flowering of this, of this new, uh, uh, new economy. So the big move, of course, was moving out of the Stone Age into farming. Uh, that was a brilliant, brilliant move that happened, uh, uh, you know, probably the first uh, agriculture kind of began around 8,000 years ago, but really kicked into gear four or 5,000 years ago and spread from the Mesopotamian area in the Middle East up through Europe and, and down into uh, India and across the world. 
And uh, I'm speaking Mesopotamian right now. That sounds crazy, but actually uh, the, uh, the scientists call it Indo-European. We're all part of the Indo-European language group, whether we're speaking German, whether we're speaking English, whether we're speaking uh, Afghani, uh, uh, those are all related together. And why is that? It's because the farming culture spread in all directions from Mesopotamia. And as it spread, it carried its language with it. And then combined with the local languages in each area. So uh, German is different than uh, Italian because the people living in Germany at the time the farmers came in spoke a uh, a different kind of a language in the north uh, in the hunter-gatherer phase than the uh, people living in Italy did in the south, as was the Mesopotamian uh, syntax combined with the languages that were local, you get German versus Italian. And uh, so all the languages in Europe kind of, you can see through them to the ancient languages that were there before the farming culture came in. Uh, so then we're a world of farmers. Uh, that allowed the uh, development of city-states because when you're getting up every day looking for food, you can't be much larger than a small tribe. Uh, otherwise, you'll overeat the area. But once you've got uh, the new technology of agriculture, now you can uh, store food and uh, people live longer and uh, survive longer and could support larger cities. And so then we had the great age of empires. And uh, some of you have seen the television series Game of Thrones. I mean, that's the world we pretty much lived in right up through to the feudal age for really four or 5,000 years. What's very interesting though about uh, any of these eras, if you interview anyone in the era, they can't imagine anything different. So the hunter-gatherers couldn't imagine the whole farming culture, the whole agriculture culture. Uh, the agriculture uh, era, if you interview anybody in the year 1200, they don't see this coming, <laughs> the age of mass production. And really it started in Germany. A lot of people don't realize it, but the uh, the uh, the era of the uh, the industrial era that we're in now really began in Mainz, Germany, in 1450, and that was when uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press. Uh, how what's the printing press got to do with mass production and industrialization worldwide? Well, because suddenly uh, people realize instead of making things one at a time, if we make a, thousands of them at a time, the price per unit drops really low. So really from 1450 till 1500, printing presses spread around Europe uh, from Mainz. Uh, they spread uh, throughout the various cities in Europe. And by the end of 1500, there were printing presses in all the major cities in Europe. But what astounded me when I went to Mainz, because I went to Germany to see the printing press, they have it in the Gutenberg Museum in Mainz outside of Frankfurt. And um, I was stunned. It's a very small press. It's not that big. Uh, but there was a chart on the wall above the press it showed the number of books in circulation from 1450 to 1500. And the books in circulation in Europe, there were 9 million people living in Europe in uh, 1450. Um, and so the books in circulation in Europe were around maybe 10 or 20,000 books, mainly in libraries at the Vatican or at royal families and things like that. People didn't read. Farmers didn't read. Soldiers didn't read. I mean, there were, really weren't the school systems and things we have today because basically you were born in a farming community, you worked the farm, or you, the only alternatives you had were to become a soldier or to go into the priesthood. But uh, generally, uh, you know, you, were, you pretty much lived the way your parents and grandparents did forever. And so uh, there was no reading really, uh, and only the royal families and the, um, and the church uh, uh, people uh, read pretty much. But from 1450 to 1500, the number of books in circulation in Europe went from, say, 20,000 books to 20 million books by 1500. Wow. And then we know what happened in the 1500s. Renaissance, Great Age of Discovery. I mean, a huge explosion. Well, guess what? I think we're on the cusp of another one right now. And so... Uh, so anyway, the industrial age uh, is the world we've been living in uh, actively for the last couple hundred years, but growing steadily for the last four or 500 years. Uh, along with it comes capital, because if you're going to mass produce anything, that means you've got to get all the materials together up front. You've got to hire all the labor up front. You've got to have the factory. You've got all these costs. 
Well, you've got to have risk capital to fund all that because by the time you make these 10,000 items and get them out to all the cities and towns around the country and get the money back, uh, that could be a year or more. And so risk capital and mass production go together and they create the economy that we currently have today. I'm noting this because we're leaving this behind. We've got something new coming in. And that's what happened because in the ag age, we didn't have uh, these, uh, this, this capital and mass production model either. And in the hunter-gatherer age, we didn't even, have, we didn't even bother with money. Uh, so, um, so really, these, these transformations, these inflection points are really remarkable. They change everything and shake them to their roots. So our whole society is going to be shocked at what's coming next. Anyway, mass production plus capital created all the factories and all the incredible items that we have today. Um, but of course, uh, it is a, um, uh, a system uh, based on uh, digging things out of the ground and turning them into objects. Uh, so um, if you want to make steel, you've got to get iron ore out, then you've got to smelt it, and then you've got to shape it, and then you can make a car. Uh, if you want to make the car to go, then you've got to dig the oil out of the ground, then you've got to refine it, then you've got to get the gasoline, you've got to get the gasoline and the gas pumps, and now you've got a transportation system. And so you can kind of see, we've been really focused on, in phase one as hunter-gatherers, just finding food to eat. Uh, so the, the scarce resource was food. Uh, in phase two, once we learned how to grow food and uh, maintain uh, farms, then the scarce resource became land. And so a lot of the fights in the world, uh, the wars and things were over control over land mass. In the uh, industrial age, uh, it was about raw materials, getting cheap raw materials from out of the ground and putting them together and making objects. So now the average person in the world today lives better than a king or queen did two or 300 years ago. Just Medicine alone, if you got sick 200 years ago, you died pretty rapidly. Modern medicine makes the average person uh, live uh, an average lifespan of now maybe 70, 80 years. Whereas during the age of the kings and queens, uh, the average lifespan was probably 30, 35. So uh, this, uh, the, these, uh, these technologies, as they move forward, uh, they, they give us, in one level, they solve the food problem. Next level, uh, uh, when we come into this uh, mass production area, we start to live as good as the kings and queens did. But now we, the raw materials are the uh, limiting factor. And um, so now uh, coming right after the industrial age is something that we call the digital age. And that's really, we've got our one foot in each right now because what really happened when the digital age came in with the first computers in the 50s and 60s, it was simply there to serve the industrial age. It just made the industrial age work better. And so we get, uh, we can see the explosion that happens here uh, with the history of technology. Uh, we, we, we roll along pretty slowly here from the agricultural revolution uh, all the way up. But boy, when, when we turn the corner, uh, wow, uh, lifespans increased, uh, uh, technology increased, numbers of people increased, and the average Income per person worldwide increased. This is the global GDP average uh, during that period of time. So something's happening here in this last couple hundred years. We're on a exponential ramp, and this is the industrial age. And we and it's been remarkable. The only reason we're taking a minute to look at this stuff is to see what's happened. Why? What is this moment in time we're in right now, and where have we come from? Well, we're an evolutionary species that generally was evolving pretty smoothly over time until pretty recently. And then we went on a tear. And once we got the factory model understood, it just exploded. And it's still exploding. And then we've added a digital component. Uh, we added uh, computers in the 50s and 60s. That accelerated the mass production culture even more. And so we're kind of used to it. But if we would go back 10, 20,000 years, I mean, wow, the pace of change was, <laughs> we do more in a week, you know, than people would do in like a decade uh, in that time in terms of uh, evolution of technology or society or things like that. So computers were a huge breakthrough. Uh, they allowed everything to be accelerated uh, more effectively, to be managed more effectively. And the period from 1950 to 1970 really is the era of computers spreading around the world and becoming really is central to every corporation and to every government. 
Uh, but then, of course, uh, that makes us vulnerable in a war. Um, if we're so dependent on these computers, uh, then uh, one good missile strike on the major computer complex and suddenly you're in trouble. Uh, so um, uh, we came up with uh, this new idea, a digital protocol, not owned by a company, but open and free to use by anybody in the world. And we try to make a network out of that. Uh, and so um, we think that this was the most crucial breakthrough in our era and really launches the digital age effectively. And that happened in uh, 1969 uh, with the dawn of the internet. So once you've got an open protocol, now I don't have to call IBM and say, hey, can I plug my computer into your network? No. I just follow the protocol and I can plug a computer into the network and the network can just grow exponentially without any central authority controlling who's allowed in and out. So this really set the foundations for what we're calling the exponential economy. Now, think about this last couple hundred years. It feels like the exponential economy already. The industrial age has just been remarkable. But no, what's about to happen is going to make that seem like the Stone Age. And we call it Renaissance 2.0. We think we're right at the dawn of a new Renaissance. It's going to completely shake our cultures right to their roots. So in 1969, uh, the internet begins with four computers, one at Stanford, one at UCLA, one at Santa Barbara, and one at Utah, just to test it. Uh, now, that, the moment that was started up, the internet has never had a down day since. Think about that. This is a machine that we've created, a digital machine, and it's spread from four computers, and now we're up to 40 billion computers all plugged into it. That's exponential. That's exponential. That's what we're unleashing on ourselves. We are becoming exponential cultures. So if you had interviewed anybody in 1970, how many computers do you think there'll be in 2020? Oh, a million. <laughs> you know? Gosh, a lot, <laughs> 40 billion. No, I mean, you just look at this. This is the, this is an image of the internet network behind it, that picture there. That's not just some abstract piece of art. It's a complex multi-layered thing with satellites and fiber optic cables under the oceans and everything. And it's growing fast while we're having this conversation. More computers are being plugged into it. And so it's, it's, this is this thing about exponential versus linear. Linear is 1, 2, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Exponential is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. Wow, 10 to 256. Hmm. But in the very beginning of the growth, you, it isn't that different. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 4, 8. Eh, you know, you can kind of put yourself to sleep and going, oh, this is just growing regularly. But what happens is it's at a certain point, it comes around the corner and it starts to go straight up and you get massive amounts of change in short periods of time. And that's what we're facing right now. Uh, that's, why it's, uh, that's why we're having this conversation. And I think that's why we're all interested in what these technologies might do to our workplaces and to our factories and corporations and our schools and everything. And we can see the, uh, the, the web growing, uh, just rapidly growing. HTTP is uh, growing really uh, fast here. Uh, from the uh, read-only web to the read-write web to the social web. It continues to grow uh, over time, uh, massively scaling. But now we've got something else happening. In addition to the web going exponential, we've got all these other technologies going exponential. Autonomous cars, drones, augmented and virtual reality, robotics, IoT, blockchains, computer vision. I mean, these are all new technologies that weren't around or not active back in 90, 1995 when the World Wide Web was created. So the World Wide Web, hmm, what did we do here? The internet connected all the machines. So once you've got the machines connected, now you can send messages between the machines. So that opened up email as the killer app. Then with the World Wide Web, you could make a web page. Uh-huh. So now we've got a a world wide web of pages and websites made of web pages. So we went from eight web pages in 1994. We have 8 billion web pages today. Wow. So from four computers to 40 billion in 50 years, from eight web pages to 8 billion in 25 years. Hmm. Now we've got all these new things and they're not connected. 
They don't work together. We want, a, we want a world wide web of everything. We want a world wide web that connects all of our cars, allows us to manage our cities, understands robots and drones and how to handle them and manage them, allows us to see the world through augmented and virtual reality, the way we look at websites now. It doesn't exist, it can't be done, it hasn't been working that way. HTTP is a hypertext transfer protocol. That's about transferring text. What's that, could do? what's that got to do with where a vehicle is allowed to drive or a drone can land or what speed they can go or where, where, what a robot's allowed to do under what authority? These are the problems we're facing now. These exponential technologies, billions of dollars are being spent on them and they don't talk, they're not on the web. We have a fragmented world right now. Everything is open. We're being hacked heavily. Uh, our privacy rights are in danger. We don't know what to trust online. Uh, everything we do is tracked. Uh, we don't know if there's a drone in the sky. Is that a friendly drone or is that a not friendly drone? We don't know anything. We're blind right now. This thing's coming at us really fast. So we need a new protocol. If we go back to the foundation of the internet, the protocol was TCP IP. That allowed all the machines to talk to each other and each machine could have an address. Then with the World Wide Web, we had a new protocol, also put into a nonprofit foundation, given away for free, hypertext transfer protocol, and a language that went with it called hypertext markup language. And uh, that allowed, that protocol made the World Wide Web possible. We still had to build the websites, but now we had a way to do it. So obviously if we wanna connect everything, we need a new protocol that connects everything. We need, we need a hyper everything transaction protocol. We call it the hyperspace transaction protocol because human beings do things in spaces. And so here it is. Here's the way the internet has evolved over the last 50 years. So back in uh, 1970, you can see TCP IP there at the protocol level. And the uh, data is, in our, uh, is on our LANs or on our computers in uh, files. Um, the logic is programs and the interface is desktops, uh, GUI interfaces. And if you interview anybody at that time, they think this is amazing. Uh, we've got a computer on our desk and we've got email. What more could you ever want? And then we come up with HTTP, that's the World Wide Web. And suddenly uh, the logic moves from programs to websites. The uh, data moves onto web servers and uh, the interface is a browser. Wow, but we don't lose the old, the old uh, st set. So we still send email, even though we're surfing the web. And then with the uh, mobile web comes in. Now we've got apps. Now the data's in the cloud. Now the interface is a touchscreen. And we still surf the web and we still send email. So we don't lose anything, but the new onion skin, the new layer, we do 80% of the time in. And so here we are now with web 3.0, we call it the spatial web. It's a hyperspace transaction protocol. And again, that HSTP makes the spatial web possible. You people, all of the companies, all of us building spatial applications is what makes the uh, web uh, become a reality. So just as we went from eight web pages in uh, 1994 to eight billion today, uh, we'll go from eight web spaces today to probably eight billion web pages in 2030 or 2035. Because these web spaces can be built by artificial intelligence so that we're not just waiting on uh, people to sit around and think up a website and build it. AIs can build web spaces themselves. And so you can see this new stack has got AI at the logic level and smart applications running on blockchains and things like that. It's got blockchain and edge technologies at the data level. And it's got augmented and virtual reality and IoT devices at the interface level. Now, we don't lose Web 2.0, Web 1.0, or the, or the uh, email web. We can still use those as we like, but we've got this whole new thing. And it enables something that people are calling Industry 4.0. The Japanese call it uh, Society 5.0. A lot of people are working on smart cities. This is what this is all about. Uh, so this is really what the spatial web is, is, uh, is here for, is to enable this new breakthrough. And it had to be different because uh, when you're making a, uh, a new environment, a, a transformational technology, it's not just a faster horse. It really is a new thing entirely. It is transportation, 
but it is a new kind of transportation. So Web 2.0 is mobile apps, touchscreens, cloud, big data. Web 3.0 is artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, edge technologies, blockchains. So you can kind of see this is a, a big transformation that's going to take place. We've done it already from horses to cars. Now we're going to do it from the World Wide Web to the spatial web. And so HSTP, Hyperspace Transaction Protocol, instead of allowing every document to be connected, it allows everything to be connected. Literally, satellites can actually give every tree on the planet a decentralized ID. So we can actually measure the carbon footprint of the planet and understand how many trees need to be planted to offset the carbon we're putting out, things like that. Every car in the city, every, you know, everything, everything's now talking to each other. So in, in a way, we're kind of creating a, the world as a computer game. And in the process, it helps us uh, attack the problems of hacking, tracking, and faking that we're dealing with now. Every database in the current uh, world has been hacked, and everything you do in the uh, web is tracked. So uh, the spatial web uh, brings in something called self-sovereign identity. And that means that you own your own data in the spatial web. You don't log into anything. Uh, you are sovereign on the web. You're always logged into the web. And as we start to wear augmented reality glasses, uh, which are coming on stream pretty rapidly in the 20s, um, we'll have uh, holographic images uh, mixed in with the real world in a way that seems perfectly natural to us. And that'll change again the way we work and study and entertain ourselves and socialize. So there is a 2D to 3D problem. Uh, all of our information is generally simplified and put in uh, two-dimensional ledgers, uh, but the world's messy and in 3D. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, new web is in 3D as well. And again, the technology can handle it because computer gaming has grown up into being uh, industry larger than 100 billion a year. And uh, it's, the chips can handle 3D now. The networks can handle 3D now. So spatial web is a three-dimensional web as well. And it's symbolic to spatial. Here you can kind of see uh, there on the left was our old uh, texted uh, driving instructions. Uh, now we're using maps. Uh, next, we're going to go to full spatial. So we actually see the information embedded in the world. And again, here you can see it. The old web is here. Go into this warehouse and find these things and in this order and do this thing. It could be on a handheld or it could be on a laptop or whatever. In the future, you just have your glasses on or whatever, and suddenly it just walks you through and guides you through whatever you're supposed to do. So we're embedding the information. We're getting it out from behind the screen and putting it into the world. Uh, the third uh, big uh, area is artificial intelligence. Um, uh, the, the AI has been growing up from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and people always wondered, well, will AI ever be as smart as a human? And uh, there were half, half, the, half the computer scientists said yes and half said no. And so they asked, well, what would be a test? Well, you know, obviously you can make a chess computer, but it can never beat a grandmaster. So here, we're, here it is, here's uh, Deep Blue beating uh, Gary Kasparov in 1997 to win the World Chess Championships. He's the reigning grandmaster at the time. Um, but AI hasn't stopped, that was 23 years ago. AI is growing itself really fast. Look what's coming, uh, right out of science fiction movies, Jarvis. Um, the, the only thing they got wrong in the science fiction movie is only Tony Stark had Jarvis. But AI is a network service in the spatial web. Everybody gets their own personal assistant. Everybody has a smartphone now. And you take a look at a smartphone. I mean, it's an expensive device. Uh, you've got to get them uh, made in a factory and then sell them in stores. And uh, we went from zero smartphones to 4 billion smartphones in 10 years flat. Pretty much anybody that wants a smartphone today can get one. They make them in uh, China now for about $50 each. And the Google interface and uh, operating system is free. So an Android smartphone is not expensive. Uh, a, a, a government could, get every, could get, give every student an, uh, an iPad or a smart kind of device and all the books and everything they ever want are right there. So AI for everyone, that's a big part of the spatial web. AI everywhere and for everyone. And so really you get networked augmented intelligence. It's the partnership between the AI and the human. So a lot of what we're gonna be learning in the future isn't just going to college and studying to raise our intelligence. It's going to be learning how to work with AIs to solve problems. 
we may pose the problem and the AIs give us multiple simulations and possible solutions, then we can say, we like number 23. Give me uh, 20 versions of that. So you can kind of see the partnership between the human and the AI is really the story. It's not AI replacing humans. It's AI interacting with humans. And guess, who's, guess who else is going to increase their intelligence? Humans. We have no upper limit on what our intelligence is. Uh, we're, we, think, we, know we're, we know if you interview uh, a person from the Stone Age and a person today, a person today knows a lot of things that the person in the Stone Age doesn't know. But a person in 2100 is going to know a lot of things that we don't know right now. So we're going to augment our intelligence and increase our intelligence dramatically. So this is a double helix, a double spiral between the AIs and the humans. We, we're, we're, they're, we're growing them and they're growing us. So at the end of the day, we get, we've got all these kids, all the parents have been complaining to the kids, you're playing games too much, you're playing too many games. Actually, they've been preparing perfectly for the world we're stepping into. This is how we're going to manage our planet. And we're going to have the city game. I mean, we're going to, if you're going to manage a smart city, you're going to you have to uh, look at it very much like a game. You're going to be able to see every building and their carbon footprint and the traffic patterns and all kinds of things. You may, you may entrust AI to say uh, when the weather in, uh, in, in Berlin is uh, uh, zero degrees Celsius and if there's any rain, then um, slow down all autonomous vehicles to um, uh, 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, something like that, uh, because uh, it automatically knows the weather and knows the potential for ice on the road, and so it can automatically adjust it. Oh, well, guess what? That's very, very much the way a computer game works. So it's the gamification, really, of our lives and of our work. We're going to get gamified at all levels. Uh, uh, already, uh, uh, we, once you can measure things, then you can reward uh, behavior. Uh, so um, I think we're going to see, and I think Steffi's probably talking about this a little bit with you all, a gamification of the workplace is going to be a big thing. Uh, it really, people love games. They love, and they love uh, competing, and, uh, and they actually enjoy uh, really doing well. And it makes work fun. Um, and um, I think we're going to see gamification throughout our, our, our systems rapidly. Um, and then we had a really big evolutionary event 65 million years ago. The uh, asteroids hit and pretty much wiped out the dinosaurs. And the mammal, the age of the mammals appeared thereafter. Um, big events like this, or like the pandemic, or like big wars, lead to really unleashing a lot of change. And so um, uh, we think this pandemic that we're going through right now, as bad as it is, and uh, as difficult as it is, and how many uh, people have had to die, and uh, it's just been a total mess uh, for our uh, planet, has stopped our economies, and uh, changed everything. At another level, it's a little bit similar to the, uh, to the asteroid uh, era uh, hitting uh, when, when it knocked out the dinosaurs. I think uh, we've trained now an, uh, an entire planet of people to learn how to use the network uh, as a place to socialize, as a place to work, as a place to learn, uh, as a place to entertain themselves. And so we're transitioning from a kind of a, uh, an earth-based, almost uh, dig things out of the ground, make objects, to a network-based economy, a network-based civilization, where we make experiences out of photons. Wow, there's no scarce resources with photons. Wow, there's no scarce resources with experiences. Those experiences could be learning experiences. They could be health experiences. They could be transformational consciousness experiences. Many of us study yoga and meditations. Well, imagine creating uh, you know, tools like that for everybody on the planet to not only increase their intelligence, but to actually evolve their minds. So we think we're stepping into a new economy. And uh, we think the first 50 years of the internet really was there to serve the old economy. We're just turning around right now and we're at the dawn of the next economy. And um, it, it happened really the same thing with, uh, with engines in the past. Uh, the, the internal combustion engine and steam engines and things were first used for agriculture. But, but after a while, they realized, wait a minute, we can make something like a car. <laughs> and then, then the, the modern transportation world blew up and became the foundation of the new economy for that time. And so um, the digital technologies initially, they, we've been using them to just make our factories run better, our businesses run better, our, our governments run better. But now, 
They're becoming the next economy. They are the business. So obviously the education is going to be, how do you operate in a network environment? There's no borders, there's no languages. They're, we're all here together. We can see things. I don't have to tell you about it. I can show it to you in three dimensions. And we're gonna get smart everything out of this. I mean, smart cities, smart grids, you know, smart homes, smart cars, smart devices, smart healthcare, right on the line. We are about to build a smart world. In a way, it looks like we're installing a new operating system on the planet. And that's the way we see the spatial web. It's an operating system for the next civilization. We're gonna install it from 2020 to 2050. By 2050, it should be well installed and spread worldwide and really allow the flowering, which we call Renaissance 2.0, to really happen from 2050 to 2100. At that point, you're really looking at a, a, an amazing science, you know, science fiction world. Uh, one of the things that's coming along in smart healthcare is longevity. I mean, people will look back in the future and go, can you believe it? People in the 20th century died under 100 years of age. It'll be like hearing that somebody died as a teenager now. We're going to live to 150. 200, 300, 400 years of age, we're solving the longevity problem. You know, it's just unbelievable what's about to happen. We're about to become the people we've been dreaming about. This is, what, this is what's going on right now. This is why we had this strange uh, period of time in America this last four years. I don't want really to really talk, talk politics, but definitely this was a regressive phase for us because people were trying to hold on to the old. They could feel the the, the pull of the new pulling us in. And it's scary because there's a huge transformation. Jobs are lost. We have to retrain people. We have to learn how to live in our cities in a new way. We've got to understand how to distribute income and wealth more fairly. I mean, these are just basic. We've got to be able to grow, but do it sustainably so we don't destroy the atmosphere. I mean, on and on, we've got a series of problems in front of us. Well, now we can solve them all and we're going to, <laughs> but we're going to have to become different people. We can't do it from the old model. <laughs> you know, Einstein used to say, you can't solve the problem from the, uh, from the state of mind that's created the problem. <laughs> you've got to grow up. You've got to, come, uh, you've got to have a, a new vision. So this new economy is uh, really uh, uh, about to blow up. And look what happened from the industrial age, from the agricultural age. The industrial age was 100 times larger. Oh, so this new economy is going to be much larger than our current economy. We're at $80 trillion GDP right now. We could probably be at 800 trillion in the 2050 to 2080 time frame. Oh, that creates a huge amount of abundance and wealth that can be shared. So, yeah, average person today lives better than a king or queen did 150 years ago. Average person in probably 60 years will have the similar amount of change. Will probably live better than the wealthiest person does today. And we got this little thing called artificial intelligence coming on stream. Um, that's at the core of the spatial web. Uh, AI everywhere. Um, and look, it's impacting everything, politics, government, transport, retail, education, right around the horn, workplace, sports, aerospace, online shopping, everything. AI is going to enter every part of our lives. And again, it's not replacing us, it's augmenting us. We're going to vote on what we want the parameters of, of things to be. We're going to make decisions and we're going to partner with AI to implement those decisions. Well, guess what? That's what we do with our bodies already. I don't have to, if I'm getting ready to climb a flight of stairs, I don't have to calculate the number of stairs and then calculate how much I should raise my heartbeat so that I've got enough oxygen in my blood to feed the muscles to get me up those stairs. I've got an AI in me. It's called the autonomic nervous system. It's automatically adjusting things. If I cut myself, it automatically sends white blood cells to heal. We're building an autonomic nervous system for the planet. We're building an autonomic nervous system for our cities. We're building an autonomic nervous system for our families, for our lives, for our health. These, these watches we're wearing right now that kind of track our biometrics, yeah, we'll have shirts that do that. And we'll be plugged in to our health coaches. Ch and AIs will notice anything going slightly off, catch it early. So this is, <laughs> I, Everything I'm saying is, doesn't do justice to what's about to happen. From 2020 to 2050, it's going to blow our minds. And little things like uh, tokens. 
Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, all these new, uh, new currencies, they're generated digitally online. And so we've, we've seen with uh, even Bitcoin right now, uh, Bitcoin uh, was a penny, then it went to 10 cents, then it went to a dollar, then it went to $10, then it went to $100, then it went to $1,000, then it went to $10,000, now it's going to $100,000 per Bitcoin. Why is that? Well, it's because there's a limited number, there's a set number of Bitcoins and there's more people that want to use them all the time. Well, why do they want to use them? Well, when you're living in a network environment and doing network business, I can, this is email money. I used to send a letter to my you know, uncle in Berlin <laughs> and it took two weeks. Then I got email, bing, send it and they would get there immediately and he would write back immediately. So right now, if I want to send $100,000 to my uncle in Berlin, it takes it a week to get there usually with all kinds of complications and banking interrelationships and wire transfers. Or I can just go, think one, and he's got it in one second. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is email, uh, email to mail is tokens to, to uh, euros and dollars, right? Obviously, we're going to make digital euros and digital dollars as well. So one point is we're moving to a digital, a digital currency environment. Uh, but because these digital currencies, when they have a limited number, can grow in value, um, you can kind of see how universal basic income could become a reality with them, and even universal basic savings accounts. So if we had given everybody uh, one Bitcoin, uh, you know, 10 years ago or t years ago when they were 10 cents each, uh, those Bitcoins are now worth you know, $40,000 for Bitcoin, and they're going up. So you can kind of see uh, what's going to happen over there. They're, they're a wealth generating quality, understanding how to, this is called tokenomics, how to understand the economics of tokens. And we're doing a lot of work in that area because AIs can help shape uh, the token economic models so that we create the most value for the most people. And this really then helps us address this fundamental problem with Abraham Maslow identified, and that is the human need pyramid. We've got these basic physiological needs. Uh, if we're stuck at that level where we're in survival, we're going to act very differently than if those things are all handled and we're coming from a more wealthy and relaxed place. As we move up this ladder, uh, we can kind of see each individual takes this journey and they can stop wherever. Uh, but also whole cultures take this journey. Uh, Germany is taking this journey. America is taking this journey. Everybody's taking this journey. We're kind of slowly moving up these, these levels. And so I, we think that uh, with Renaissance 2.0 or the, the spatial web era, we're going to really move our whole culture into the growth needs from the deficiency needs era. And that'll really lead to an uh, extraordinary explosion of new ideas, just like the Renaissance had. And of course, you can start up companies to address these needs. Here's a bunch of companies that have launched uh, just in the last uh, five years to address each of these layers of needs. Uh, the, the, this, this shouldn't be a pyramid either. What will happen is it'll slowly bulge in the middle more and more as, as the central, central needs come up. And so what you have is this thing kind of growing over time and becoming more like a square or and finally maybe it becomes an inverted pyramid because the physiological needs and the safety needs are all handled in the, in, the, in the future. That's what we really all want. And then along with it is not only are they solving the needs, but it's actually changing the way we think. This is kind of the evolution of our uh, cultural thinking, our evolution of our values. Uh, so if you're in survival mode, uh, you're at the very bottom uh, as you move uh, up the ladder. Right now, uh, many people feel we're in the uh, orange zone, which is kind of uh, the world of rational, uh, business, strategic thinking, opportunistic. Um, now, as we move to the green mode, then that's uh, dealing with sustainability. And then above that is integrative and holistic, where we really start to see all of these have their purposes at various times. But as we evolve as cultures, we move up these ladders. Um, so there's the future. Uh, we have a smart world, fully integrated, and it's invisible. But actually, you're, you're, we're living inside a hologram. Uh, we've got our physical world and our digital world linked together. We have an interoperable world that's all connected. And um, now that you've got this world, anybody can build services for this world. And they're called, instead of web sites, they're called web spaces or spatial applications. And so we've also built a set of tools that people can use to build spatial applications. 
We've got, we built an operating system like iOS for smart apps, for spatial apps. And then, so now you've got a three layer uh, system just like we have with the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web has HTTP at the bottom um, and, and uh, websites at the top. Uh, you can uh, code your websites in HTML, but most people use WordPress or uh, something like that. Uh, so we build a platform. So the web protocols make the spatial web possible. Uh, the platforms make it easy. So now thousands or millions of people can make spatial applications, and that's how we're going to get to eight, 8 billion spatial applications. So how do we do it? Uh, we make a digital copy of our world at the physical level. And then we merge the, or it could be of the city, it could be of any object, then we merge the digital and the physical, and now you've got a digital twin. And, that, and once you've got a digital twin, now you can start to program it. And you can have layers of information uh, that have to be layered in there. And now you can go from a smart city to a smart nation to a smart world. That's really where we're headed. Um, we do it this way. Here you've got three kinds of uh, levels of programming in here. Who? The identity level, who or what, is allowed to do what, uh, what kind of activity, under what authority, and where, and for how long. Uh, with that level of programmability, we can start to program our world the way we can program a computer game. Here's a kind of an example of the programming language, hyperspace modeling language. So here you've got who, who or what things, activity things, and location things, and here you can see an example. Here's a program, a robot by virtue of the Health and Human Services Authority, can operate within the USC Medical Center and has the right to take blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see this is a natural language programming. So you're just be able to talk to the computer and program it for the spatial web. It's a, it's a language oriented. It's not English, it's any language you want, but uh, you can actually speak to it and program it. So you can control robots, you can build spaces, you, you can say, give me a, uh, you know, Give me a, a house uh, in uh, the style of a, a New England cottage and the AI will build it for you right in front of you. And then you can work with that to get the exact house you want and send that to a contractor to be built. So we call this a COSM and uh, we think it's really central. Here we have a lot of things going on in a smart city, uh, but to the, uh, to the spatial web, it sees everything that's going on and everything there can see everything else that's going on because we're all immersed in a digital hologram. And so we got uh, spatial, semantic, and social data. And so that is, has to do with identity versus location versus policies. As these all come together, now you can set the rules and rights and privileges of how the city should operate. And now everything can adapt in real time to changing circumstances because they're all aware of each other and all talking to each other. And our symbolic information moves into the real world. And instead of seeing it on a thing, you see, you just have your glasses on, you actually see the world the way it is. Here, do this, put this here, use this equipment, and everything is being recorded and put on blockchains. So there's a record of everything that's happened. And the results of this are tremendous. 35% productivity boost. I mean, incredible breakthroughs happening. Uh, so you, you, as a company, you can't afford not to use this stuff because it pays for itself in like a few months and uh, gives you a competitive edge. And if you don't do it, your competitors have the edge. Uh, it reorganizes things like warehouses. This is a, uh, on the left is a warehouse that's unorganized. On the right is an AI reorganized warehouse saying, hey, the items that are most used uh, go all together. So whether it's logistics, smart, supply chains, whether it's smart buildings, facilities, uh, whether it's smart ecosystems, all the way up into and including our climate. Uh, these are the kinds of apps that need to be built uh, by all of you, by all the companies. And these are some of the use cases, design, maintenance, analytics, drones, location permissions, uh, no, ex no cashier transactions, managed transportation, uh, control of drones and things like that. We can actually have drone highways now in the sky because the spatial web is in 3D. So you can actually program space, uh, wayfinding, and you can find anything anywhere, just like you now do a search on Google to find something on, on the World Wide Web. Now you can find anything in the spatial web. Adaptive health, massive breakthroughs. We're at the dawn of the health explosion. And even uh, micromanaging our uh, energy from the house, from the appliance to the house, to the neighborhood, to the buildings, all the way up to the entire city. 
looking at our climate accounting onto the entire planet. So now we have an accurate climate model. And with that accurate climate model, we can protect ourselves from overheating the, uh, overheating the climate. And so we're working with Yale and MIT on the Open Climate Project right now uh, to create a uh, advanced climate accounting system. Uh, anyway, with all this, you get, you can see, you get huge breakthroughs in supply chains. So if you, can you can trace anything. Is this really organic? Uh, is this really a good quality steel? Uh, uh, ultimately, you, you get to a smart city. Uh, you know, everything's really running together in a smooth way with privacy protections. That's critical. Uh, finally, uh, we can really address our uh, SDG, our uh, uh, development goals, and uh, really help to uh, really manage our planet so that it works uh, the best for the most. And uh, these are huge markets. McKinsey estimates that just uh, interoperable IoT alone is a $5 trillion uh, market. Uh, 100 World Economic Forum is going as a $100 trillion opportunity. I mean, you can start companies. You can convert your own company. These are huge opportunities. Uh, there's uh, the former uh, vice chairman of Deloitte uh, saying the impact of the spatial web will dwarf the internet, change how we live, work, and thrive. There's um, uh, Peter Diamandis, uh, same way the trillions of dollars were created on the web. Uh, we're going to now see it with the uh, spatial web. Uh, the way we've designed the spatial web is we made it open. Uh, the protocols are open and free. Uh, only Cosm uh, is a commercial product, so anybody can compete with us. Anybody can build their own tools. Uh, just like there's many uh, website development tools available. You don't have to use WordPress. You can use Shopify or Wix or all kinds of things. We've done the same thing. We want to encourage everybody to build these spaces. Uh, we wrote a book about it. So if you want to dive in and have a deep dive, uh, there's a book you can get called The Spatial Web online. And uh, that's uh, a quick look at uh, what we think is coming.